So yes, exactly understanding those backgrounds, how uh, on the one hand we have this desire of the state to look into its citizens' communications um, ongoing till today, but also these fundamental shifts in how uh, the reactions to um, such forms of national and international surveillance have been, I think, are uh, that's exactly the transition into the next session that we'll be focusing on now. I would like to introduce uh, the second keynote of this morning. Um, Maria Sinu is a policy associate on the privacy project at the Center for Internet and Society in Bangalore, India, and will now be speaking to us about the work that she's been doing there, investigating surveillance in India and the general, um, yes, national policy on surveillance especially from a mobile perspective. Um, so she'll be sharing some of the insights of the research that she's been doing with us in a, in a keynote, which will kick off the next session entitled The Suspect Society. Welcome, Maria. Hello, good morning, and thank you very much for being here today. Um, so I have good news and bad news. Uh, First of all, the good news is that, hey, for all those who are supporting globalization and connectivity, it's worked. The bad news, however, is that as a result of this, well, basically, we have to pay a price, our freedom, essentially. And I can't think of anything worse than that, uh, in the sense that when we live in a world where we don't have uh, freedom from suspicion, essentially, we're always, you know, uh, guilty until proven innocent, when actually it should be the opposite. So in that sense alone, I think it's very important to look at surveillance. And through this, we can see that surveillance kind of has been globalized all over the world, even to the extent that even India um, has widespread surveillance. However, in India, um, when I talk about surveillance, the most mainstream argument I hear is that, hey, surveillance is not even a real issue. You know, like the real issues in India are poverty, corruption, diseases, and all of that. So when the majority of the population have to deal with that type of real problems, or that type of so-called real problems, um, then many argue that surveillance is not an issue at all. So I'd like to hear your thoughts on that later on, but in order to actually answer this question, if surveillance is a Western elitist issue or if it is an actual problem in India at all, I think we first have to you know, look at the, the state of surveillance in India. So in order to do this, I've been looking at, um, I've, I've been looking at laws, schemes, and technologies used in India for surveillance. So with regards to laws, the reason why I've been looking at them is because I've been trying to understand you know, what kind of surveillance is legally allowed and what isn't. So it turns out that in India, uh, there are five laws, you know, which mandate targeted surveillance. And out of these laws, there's a very controversial Information Technology Act. And in particular, it has this very, very scary uh, section, um, particularly it's called Section 69, which requires the interception of all information transmitted through a computer resource. And on top of that, as if it's not enough that all your communications in India will be uh, intercepted, on top of that, you are required to disclose your private encryption key if requested to do so by authorities. And hey, if you don't do so, then you may be sent to prison for up to seven years. This is bizarre to say the least, because the only hope you have to protect your privacy is to use encryption. And indirectly, India kind of prohibits its, its citizens from doing so. Uh, with regards to mass surveillance, now mass surveillance technically, well, um, it's not mandated by law, but it's not prohibited either. However, there are some license agreements which do mandate mass surveillance. In particular, there's the UAS license agreement, the Unified Access license agreement, which requires all ISP and TSP providers in India to purchase hardware and software at their own cost to be able to monitor their networks. However, uh, and something that we could say here is like, uh, what kind of incentive do they even have to purchase uh, these type of solutions to begin with? Because they don't really have a revenue out of this directly. Well, it really doesn't really come to that because at the end of the day, if they don't comply with the license agreements, they just can't operate. So it's not a question if the ISPs and TSP providers in India are the good guys or the bad guys. At the end of the day, they are forced to intercept on all internet and telecommunications in India. So that's the legal reality. So basically, mass surveillance in India falls like in a gray legal area. Um, it's, not, it's, not, it's not legally mandated, but it's not prohibited either. So in other words, the government does whatever it wants, and it basically implements very, very scary and controversial surveillance schemes. 
Now, before I get to the surveillance schemes, there are some data sharing schemes like uh, the NAT grid, which is a national, intelli a national intelligence grid. And what it aims to do is basically share the databases between and link them together between various departments and ministries of the government. Then uh, there's a crime and criminal tracking network system, which again shares the, data, the, the databases between 14,000 police stations across the country. Now, the data sharing schemes Although there's a lot of issues revolving around them because there currently is no data protection law in India, which means that how this data is shared and everything, all questions revolving around that are not answered in any way, legally at least, uh, there are a lot of other, you know, more controversial schemes. First of all, there's the Lawful Interceptor Monitoring uh, Program. The, law, the Lawful Interceptor Monitoring Program works on two levels. The first one is uh, with regards to telecommunications and the second one with regards to internet communications. So in the first case, all mobile operators in India are basically required to um, install their own lawful intercept and monitoring system at the premises and through that intercept all communications. With regards to internet communications, um, the government in India essentially has installed a, a lawful intercept and monitoring system at the international gateways of ISPs and that way it gets access to all internet communications. And as if that's not enough, they've gone the extra mile and they've even implemented internet monitoring systems. So these internet monitoring systems, um, I won't get into much detail, but essentially they, they intercept all types of communications, and that includes metadata and, and content data. Uh, so anything you do online in India is basically intercepted through that. We know as a fact that uh, internet monitoring systems exist in most states in India. However, uh, the government hasn't even bothered to provide tenders for them. So we only actually have tenders for two states, for Delhi and Assam. Um, but we, we know from various sources that such systems are used in other states like Karnataka, Maharashtra, et cetera. And on top of that, as if all these, all these schemes weren't enough, now there's the central monitoring system. Uh, I don't know if you've heard of the central monitoring system, but essentially what it tries to do is centralize all intercepted data. It basically aims at telecommunications, so the, the interception of uh, everything done through mobile networks in India. But then again, you may argue that, okay, most people in India, you know, they live below the poverty line. Why is any of this an issue? Well, roughly 80% of people in India have mobile phones. So since they have mobile phones, that means that everybody, even people living in the poorest of conditions, are potentially a target of surveillance. And basically, the central monitoring system, um, as it intercepts internet communications, it also indirectly intercepts internet communications because, you know, many people also use the internet through their cell phones. Most people actually. Um, so, up until now, we didn't actually have a lot of data on the central monitoring system. We knew very few things about it because, unfortunately, the Indian government has been carrying out this project in secret. Actually, it carries out most projects in secret. And in many cases, such projects lack legal, legal backing and there is no like parliamentary or public debate whatsoever with regards to that. So they kind of have this type of, the Indian government, although it does uh, support a democratic regime, it kind of has this authoritarian power where it literally implements any type of system at once, uh, regardless of what people think, or because it probably knows that most people won't resist, won't react to it, uh, which is usually the case, unfortunately. So the central monitoring system, it started literally four years ago, but we only really found out about it this year which is actually really sad. And it's been implemented in three phases. Now it's the, the, in, in the third phase, it's pretty much done. Um, roughly $72 million have been allocated for the central monitoring system. And this is something that we know that has been allocated as of 2011. So obviously much more money has been allocated to that. And that's very concerning itself because we're talking about India, right? A country with so many social and economic problems. Um, and it's crazy to think that the government is investing so much money in intercepting people's communications instead of using the money, obviously, you know, to build schools and invest money in health and other more important uh, issues. So what we know about the central monitoring system right now is that uh, it has been integrated with two of the largest TSP operators in India, and that's MTNL and Tata. So everybody using these two TSP providers, which by the way is pretty much everyone, including me in India, um, we know the fact that their data is centrally intercepted. Now, how does the CMS work? So prior to the central monitoring system, uh, TSP providers had lawful interception systems installed in the premises. Now, uh, with the CMS, these new servers called intercept, store, and forward servers 
uh, are integrated with a, with a law for interception servers, and those are then linked with uh, remote uh, monitoring centers, which are CMS centers. So the CMS has many um, data centers all around India, like one in each state, and then all of these are linked to one central uh, data center. This data center is, cu is currently being built in Delhi, and as of six months ago, we know that 80% of it was built. So here we have this massive centralization of the storage of data, and that itself is very, very problematic, because when you centralize data, you are pretty much creating a centralized point for cyber attacks, to say the least. And um, like I said, like this program lacks legal backing, no parliamentary and public debate whatsoever. Then, on top of that, on top of all of these schemes, there's another one, the UID scheme. I don't know if you've heard of it. So the UID scheme is the world's largest biometric data collection scheme in the world. Um, essentially what it does is that it requires all Indians to give up their biometric and demographic data. By biometric, I mean iris and fingerprints. And then, this and then once they give up their data, this is linked to a number called the Adar number, a 12-digit number, which then is linked to many services. So for example, in order to verify mobile numbers, you have to, have be, you have to be registered with a UID. Uh, kids in, in India, in order to go to school, they have to be registered with a UID. So, in, although in theory the UID scheme is voluntary and you can choose to use a service, actually it's mandatory because if you can't go to school, if you can't use a hospital services, if you can't use a whole wide range of services without giving up your biometric data, then how on earth is that even voluntary? Now the reason why this is even more problematic is because all of the other surveillance that I mentioned um, only really makes sense with implementation of the UID. And why is that? Because the UID serves as a unique identifier. In the sense that once you gather all this data from the interception of communications, you need to have some kind of identifier to make sure that X data, from X, com X communications data, belongs to a specific person. And that's where the UID comes in. However, the problem is that you can easily fake fingerprints, right? You can easily work yourself around it, and, they can, and the, there's a lot of uh, problems with regards to the technology even being used for that. Um, in many cases, the government loses data. We don't know how they handle it. There's been lo loads of cases of corruption that have been reported. So the UID itself is very problematic, and then when you use it as an identifier to prosecute and arrest people based on their the communications data, then you understand that that ultimately means that potentially a lot of people may be, may be arrested uh, or punished in any way for crimes they did or did not commit. Then, um, in order to understand, um, so basically now I've mentioned the laws and the schemes, but then in order to carry out the schemes, you need to have the technology, right? Like you need to have some vendors who are providing the stuff. Because a lot of people argue like, oh my God, yes, India has like 1.2 billion people. How the hell are they gonna mine so much data? Well, there's a technology for, for that, unfortunately. Um, so uh, as, as you probably know, uh, spy files, WikiLeaks, they have uh, a whole wide range of brochures from companies all over the world that sell uh, different types of surveillance technologies. I personally have started um, research on the surveillance industry in India and I have a random sample of 15 companies. And within these 15 companies, um, some crazy technologies have been disclosed. Like, we've, we've heard so much uh, talk about FinFisher and Da Vinci and such spy products, but actually, in India, some spy products are somewhat similar or somewhat scary or potentially can be just as intrusive. Um, in particular, some, some particular points uh, with regards to my data. Uh, out of the 50 companies that I have for my sample, uh, we know the fact that only seven of these companies comply with the lawful regulation standards. Only seven. So basically that means that 43 companies from my sample don't, don't even care about putting a front to show that they, you know, that they comply with the law. Then, out of these 50 companies, only 19 of them are certified. Which again is ridiculous, right? I mean, normally you're not, you're not supposed to be allowed to like, sell technologies to law enforcement agents to begin with unless you're certified. And only 19 of them have bothered to do that. And out of these 19 companies, only seven companies have actually, um, or actually ISO 27001 certified, which is an important piece of information because uh, according to, in, to Indian rules, 
uh, companies have to, um, companies that deal with sensitive personal data have to be certified with regards to that, which means that they have to have some type of certification such as the ISO 27001 certification, but they don't. And then only 19 of them have privacy policies, which means the other 31 really don't even care about what you think about how your data has been handled. So it's very problematic. Now, three of the most like harmful companies that I could quickly identify, because I, I don't have much time left, unfortunately. Uh, one of them is um, Clear Trail Technologies. Actually, you, you can, um, I've put some, I'm gonna, I've, I've gathered a lot of data about them and that's gonna be uh, on our website um, within the next two weeks. But for now, you can also look at their brochures through the spy files. Um, they have a, a whole bunch of scary technology that they sell to law enforcement agencies, including QuickTrail, which is a solution for tactical Wi-Fi monitoring. So even if you're using the internet like uh, in, in a cyber cafe or in a hotel and you think like, oh, okay, like how are they gonna track me now? Hey, they can still track you with a solution and they can even deploy spyware into your uh, computer if you're a target. Then there's mTrail, which carries out off-the-air interception of GSM phone networks, which again is very problematic because, because basically um, in 2011 in India, uh, the Home Ministry um, issued a, ban, a directive to, to ban uh, off-the-air interception. So that basically means that such, that such uh, solutions are technically illegal in India. Yet they're producing them and they're selling them all over the world. And then there's other companies like Palladian and um, um, and Comlabs Design, and they sell various types of internet monitoring solutions, SSL um, decryption solutions, and um, yeah, the, the stuff they, they sell scary, and you can check it online in our website over the next two weeks. So, uh, with regards to the question that I started off with, is surveillance a Western elitist issue? Should it concern India and Jordan and the rest of the countries um, in the developing world? Well, I would say um, no. It's definitely not an, a, a Western illness issue. It should concern everyone, and by everyone, yes, literally everyone, even in India, even people in slums in India. Um, because in the end of the day, surveillance is all about control, and it's, it's all about the loss of freedom. And is it really worth living in a world without freedom? I don't think so. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maria. Um, and the last point is a very important one. We're not just discussing this here today from a Western perspective, from a European or US perspective, but really from a global perspective. And that's exactly what the next panel, which is going to follow your keynote now, is, is going to be about. Different perspective from all corners of the world on what does it mean to be surveyed and both a cultural and a political uh, interpretation of what does privacy mean today. So please stick with us here upstage. We're not going to go into Q&A, but we're going to go straight into the panel format. And I would just now like to introduce to you the moderator of this panel. I would say she's part of the Mobilize family and we're super happy to have her back here at this event. Please welcome Gillian York from the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Gillian is the EFF's Director for International Freedom of Expression and will be hosting this next session. Please welcome Gillian. Thank you. Can I invite my panelists just to come up and join me on the stage? And I will introduce them as they're coming up. Um, so, as Geraldine mentioned, we're going to be discussing the concept of privacy in different cultural contexts, which is something that has come up over the past few days, um, with many of us asking, how do you define privacy? Um, and so, you've met Maria Zainu already from the Center for Internet and Society in Bangalore, India. We also have Da'a Ali from uh, Heber in Jordan. Darko Burkan from, how do I pronounce the name of your organization? Zashtone uh, in Bosnia-Herzegovina. And Ahmed Maui from Power 254 in Kenya. So welcome everyone. <laughs> so I think the first question I'd like to ask, and I'm, I'm, I'll hand the mic to whoever's game to answer first, is, You've all seen Maria's talk, you've seen her arguments for why privacy matters in India. Tell me, what are the arguments made in your countries for why privacy matters, or does privacy matter to you? Um, hello. Um, well, I think that the issues regarding how people perceive uh, privacy that uh, Maria uh, brought up are very similar in Jordan. People do not think privacy is a priority. Uh, and um, with uh, lots of um, security instabilities around uh, Jordan, they have real and visible reason to think so. Um, 
what uh, what Heber uh, and um, other um, uh, people are trying to do concerning uh, concerning trying to put push a privacy up for that priority list is sort of uh, at least in Heber what we do for, from a journalistic perspective is uh, to highlight uh, breaches and how and make it uh, make it very visible how this is not. Uh, theoretical uh, stuff that is not just about how um, the government could uh, use your information against you. There are cases and that's what we try to highlight and bring forward uh, for people to see. Hi everybody. Uh, <laughs> I was speaking from a perspective of where I come from, at least Bosnia, maybe the whole region. I think privacy is not an issue because I don't think we ever had it and pre people are very aware of the fact that they never had it unlike well I guess nobody actually had it but like you didn't know it as we did before and and, and actually you know like uh, why it's not such a big concern uh, is is actually for the fact that uh, previously it was it was another set of rules previously you know like if you, you knew that you were surveilled and actually, if you did something wrong, you might get punished for it very easily. You know, now it's different because it's 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 more uh, likely that you won't get punished if you do something. So, like you know, it's there's there's a progressive element in the whole in the whole story that happened over the, the past few decades. So I don't think that I think that's what people consider when they when they think about surveillance. And, I, and I'll give you an example, uh, which is very. Which something that happened like very, very, very recently in Bosnia, we had we had a census, and that was the first census since 1991, so in 23 years. And as as you might know, that's uh, that's basically an anonymous. It's it's supposed to be an anonymous uh, questionnaire for the for the for the people, but actually, on the first day of the census, the agency for statistics has uh, decided that due to the lack of storage capacity, all the forms will be kept in the houses of enumerators for 20 days. And actually, the media was outraged, we were outraged, at least a bit of the civil society, but you know, like citizens kept filing in. We even called them not to do it, but like the citizens just kept filing their questionnaires and, and then actually leaving it in the, in the hands of the people who were taking it home. And actually, even though they had uh, confidentiality agreements, none of their families had, none of their friends had, like, you know, so basically all private data was compromised and nobody had a real issue with it, like in the in the whole society, including the international community, the EU and, and, and Eurostat, which I'll come to later probably to, to the point about that. Hello. So apart from the fact that the world is round, we all breathe the same air and all that, meaning we share common problems. Um, it's a global thing. However, um, what you'd find that is not only talking about Kenya, but a lot of countries in Africa is there's a lot of people who make use of software. They subscribe to services online without a privacy policy. And a privacy policy basically covers that, for instance, things like we're not gonna expose that data to third parties and all that. So already that tells you a lot about awareness in the region, isn't it? People can subscribe to these services, they can work with them and all that without ev even bothering about having a privacy policy in place. Means that there isn't awareness of the fact that data needs to be guarded, especially when it comes from you. So, um, I mean, that in, in actual sense, uh, if, if in actual sense, that sort of if we look at Africa, it's just coming out of the Industrial Revolution at the moment. A lot of the countries out there have already come out of that. Then the Information Revolution, there's a lot of sort of awareness on data and how data should be handled and all that. But we're still in the early stages of transitioning to that. So people don't really understand the implications of what is data online, what is the mobile networks and what, what data do they have of us and all that. So it's, you'd find that especially in Kenya, there's a lot, there, there's this vibrant growth at the moment of technology and all that. And there's a lot of innovation in this space. And 
that means that a lot of solutions are coming out. People are very optimistic about uh, adopting technologies. There's been a boom, basically, in technology and the opportunities that have come up out, out of it. But this, there, there has to be that awareness that information is a guiding principle in very many aspects of life in the modern world, not only in Kenya, but in other places. So it's, it's not that. Uh, I, I don't think that when the revelation was made, for instance, for the NSA came out, it's, it's, it didn't quite impact what people thought or people talked about. It was just something in the news because they didn't understand the implications of the privacy because no one ever uses software, the privacy policy. So, I mean, that's basically what is a situation in Kenya. Thank you. Yeah. Um, actually, the situation in India is quite similar to the situation described in, in Kenya. But what I think is particularly interesting in the case of India is that uh, there is like no privacy legislation whatsoever, so no regulation for data protection. And um, so basically, the Center for Society, we've drafted a bill. And what's interesting is that throughout the various roundtables that we've had, um, the, the most of our participants that have been coming have been from the industry, so they've been CEOs of big technology companies, and they have vested interest uh, in, in the enforcement of privacy legislation. But it's all about business, really, because they know that they'll attract more customers. You know, if they if we have pri if they comply with in theory, you know, with the privacy legislation. So other than people caring, like when I, when I say people, I mean like the authorities in India. Um, other than caring about privacy in terms of business. They don't really care about privacy, in my opinion, because they haven't made any real efforts to implement a privacy law. And on top of that, they're implementing all the surveillance schemes that I mentioned before. And on top of that, they're making extra agreements with companies, uh, like um, they, they signed an agreement with Verant uh, to install an interception solution in the country, and then an, another agreement in July with, uh, with BlackBerry uh, to intercept all BlackBerry Messenger and BlackBerry inter Internet services. So, taking all of that into consideration, I think that no privacy definitely doesn't matter, which is why it's a very um, tough fight to win. So then let me ask this of, of anyone who would like to, to respond. We know that governments often use national security as the justification for surveillance, and I know that to be true in, in India to some degree, in the US certainly, um, and elsewhere of course. So, what is the public perception of that justification in the countries that you're coming from? So in India, um, I, th I think most people aren't aware of the right to privacy. Um, I, I think that I, I could go as far as saying that maybe the, not, the, not necessarily the majority, but maybe 40% of the population hasn't even ever heard of the term privacy uh, because the majority of the population in India lives in very terrible um, conditions. So I'm assuming that terms like surveillance and privacy are completely un unheard of to them. However, um, there, is some, there, there is some activism. For example, there is the Stop ICMS campaign. Um, act, sorry, the Stop ICMS um, activist group. And essentially, it's, um, it's this activist group which is protesting on the streets and blogging um, against the central monitoring system. And then there's the Say No to UID campaign, again, who are doing fantastic work and who are campaigning against the UID and who are uh, publishing articles with regards to uh, and exposing cases of fraud and scandal with regards to UID every day. But other than Anonymous in India, other than the Stop ICMS, other than um, the UID campaign, there's not much other mobility with regards to this. So I think that um, no, the vast majority don't, um, don't really, don't, it's not that they don't care, but I think that they don't really understand the issue itself. Um, well, in the case of Jordan, I think that people generally are not convinced with this um, security justification, but, um, well, at least when it comes to privacy, but I think that because people are to a certain extent uh, convinced in it in uh, other political uh, uh, terms, uh, I think it, it sort of pushed back um, uh, activism in general in Jordan uh, very much. So I think that um, not only against uh, surveillance, but also, but like against um, 
uh, all kinds of uh, uh, issues that people uh, see the, the government neg neg negatively and um, uh, certainly concerning uh, free speech uh, recently in Jordan. Uh, all these things are sort of holding back now uh, because of uh, the situations uh, in the Middle East. And I think that maybe November uh, 2012 was a sort of a, a peak for activism in Jordan. Uh, and there was like a, a really big wave of protests um, after uh, rise in oil prices. And then people really sensed the closeness of it. And the, many people really felt that Jordan could be the next Arab country uh, with a revolution. And I think it was people, most people at least, weren't ready for it. And m many people thought that we do not want to end up like Syria and with something that horrible happening on your borders and with refugees coming to tell the stories, you can't help not being afraid. So I think that held back um, activism on many levels and cert certainly uh, on privacy. But Jordan, and I think also, correct me if I'm wrong, India were named as um, two of the countries on which the NSA collects the, ma the most data. That's correct? Okay. So what has been the reaction it, from the public, even from the elite public, to the NSA spying? Well, very little, actually. I mean, Jordan was the third uh, most surveyed country in the project uh, ba uh, Boundless uh, uh, Informant, and um, that really had absolutely no echo in the media and very, very uh, little uh, people talked about it. And I think that gives you an idea of like how much uh, privacy is not a priority for people. And it's just uh, people did not ask how and why uh, Jordan is such uh, a major uh, hub for intelligence right now. So India, um, according to the Snowden leaks um, and according to the Boundless in Informant, um, India is actually ranked fifth worldwide in, te in terms of intelligence gathering by the NSA. And there actually was some mobilization in regards to this. For example, this uh, public interest litigation group in India um, filed, filed this, like, brought this case uh, to the Supreme Court in India. But the Supreme Court, after examining the situation, basically concludes to the fact that, you know, there's not much we can do about it because, unfortunately, data has been stored um, you know, abroad and we don't have jurisdiction over uh, what happens to your data when, you know, it, it goes, when it crosses borders, basically. Um, so they really didn't come to a conclusion which satisfied the public. But there has been some media coverage um, with regards to, there has been quite a lot of media coverage, actually, with, with regards to the Snowden leaks and the NSA spying countries, including mostly India, actually. Um, it has been covered by some of the biggest newspapers in the country, and there has been some debate. But then again, India is a large country, so the, obviously this debate is still, um, you know, um, seen by the minority of the people in India. And I think it's most restricted to the middle and upper class in India that, you know, are aware of the issue. But they're definitely away. I'm concerned. What about in Bosnia or Kenya? Okay, so uh, when when talking about Bosnia, you have to uh, we have to first get back into the context of the of the of the whole thing. And I think that, uh, or at least evidence show that that our government is basically in a, in a in a Paul Pry era of, of of spying at the moment or or surveilling of the of the citizens because. Uh, actually, we we do know, and that it's been out that there's there's been a lot of like uh, phone listening to or, or, of different people, and there have been like leaks of, of phone numbers that have been uh, kind of listened by the government, and, and that was that was one of the one of the outrage. But when it gets to actually monitoring uh, in the digital world, they they don't do, or at least they don't know much. I'll, I'll give you an example. Uh, we did like big, big protests in, 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 in June this year. We eventually blocked the parliament for 24 hours and then, then uh, afterwards they, they actually wanted us to, wanted to charge us for terrorism. And the biggest uh, evidence they made was a big report that was done by this, uh, as they call it, uh, special fo police force for high tech criminal where actually the report was consisting of uh, going through our Facebook profiles and, and, and actually like, you know, just taking our posts and, 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 you know, like, so I have my own special forces guy looking at my Facebook profile all the time. That's pretty much where 
surveillance is at this moment in, 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 in the digital world in Bosnia. And that's, I mean, I, I think we are lucky on that side that, that actually, you know, like still it's on that level, but, you know, we need to be aware that, 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 that you know, it's going to get more sophisticated as the time passes and we need to like, and, and that, that actually was a good point because people were aware that these things are, are happening and then that actually, you know, like they're at least thinking about it. So it was a big outrage then when, when you know, like, and, and there was a big campaign on Facebook where people were, were like kind of putting up photos of I know who's watching my profile and stuff like that. But you know, like that's pretty much where we are at at, at the moment when it, get, when it gets to government surveillance of, of the internet in, in Bosnia. Um, so I think uh, first of all to begin with there's, there's very many issues people want to deal with. They're hungry, they want to pay rent, they want to go to school, they want to be comfortable to start with. And uh, yeah, well, people are spying on you. That's, that's somehow it's not such a big concern compared to having the basics for the very, very many people sorted out. The rate of poverty is very high, as you might understand. So coupled with the fact that people just don't understand the implications of having information online and all that, um, you, you, you'll find that, um, and the other, the other issue is that there's this tendency of uh, sort of having the impression that, um, anyway, let, let me just say, it. but a, a, lot of, a, lot of, a lot of Kenyans sort of have this tendency to very much depend on, on government doing things and uh, on, on foreigners doing things and all that. So, to, to, to more of like depend on the other third party than to depend on themselves to create these opportunities. In some ways, it's, it's, you'd understand why that happens and all that. So all these factors coupled together make it not much of a big issue. But now the people who are really concerned about privacy, you'll find is a different group of people, which is the people who want to want to expose the news, the people who want to expose the new things and all that, and maybe stay anon anonymous. A lot of them don't understand how to do it, but um, so some of them have figured it out. They've figured out tools they can use and all that, and uh, to, to sort of stay anonymous and all that. So, I mean, there's, there's two parts of the equation here. There's people who are interested in being anonymous and they, they see the need to stay out of this group of being surveyed and all that, but the general public in general, it's life as usual. We, 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 get, we get screwed every day, so yeah, that's it. Thank you. Um, so I'm gonna ask one more question of my panelists before opening up for a Q&A to the audience. Um, but I, what I want to ask you is, what do you see as the biggest challenge in educating or in translating um, digital issues around surveillance and privacy to the general public? Um, well, I think that what, um, at least what we do in Heber, what we try to focus on to, uh, to bring that up is, as I said, cases of breaches and um, uh, give a sense of uh, realism, reality to, to these sort of sometimes technical, theoretical issues and I think that um, well, at least uh, recently the government has been helping us with that by cases of breaches that uh, are, you know, that c can be very re realistic and close to everyone. Recently we had a case of three activists uh, prosecuted, uh, um, charged with uh, disturbing foreign relations uh, with neighboring countries for sending WhatsApp messages uh, commenting on the Rabaa Square events. Uh, so these th three uh, activists were tried in a military court, state security court, and uh, they can be uh, locked up for up to three years. So um, when I think when people see cases like that, it's, it shocks them and uh, gives them uh, a sort of um, maybe threat that this could happen to you too. I mean, seriously, anyone commenting on 
any uh, political event around uh, the country or the region could be a possible um, a victim of uh, these uh, uh, issues if uh, he or she were under surveillance. Uh, so um, I think that um, when people feel the imminence of uh, these issues, that will push their um, uh, the push privacy up uh, their list. Anyone else? I can open it up. I can maybe agree <laughs> what, what she said. Actually, you know, like, and, and, and I think that it, it even gets harder in a country that actually doesn't have such uh, clear connections between surveillance and, and freedom of expression, like 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 it doesn't in Bosnia. And that's that's more of a more, more of a problem for us is actually how to tie to something that that, that can be uh, threatening to people to a level that they actually uh, would, would 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 understand it. And you know, like finding finding issues and, ma and making them high level in terms of in terms of the, the public visibility is probably the the, the, the biggest challenge we, we face and I think that actually you know like these events that happen every now and then that, that are actually you know like some sort of potential for, for, for high level news can be a, a place where, where, where to focus like for focus our attention and then in the meantime it will be getting as many people as possible into the into the, the core group that actually understands what it's all about and, 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 and that, that actually thinks about it. So like, you know, that's maybe the best way to do it is, is, is to use the events that, that, that actually come up and they will come up eventually on, on, on different issues. Let me just uh, ask a question so I can get the context right again. Uh, yeah, so the question was, what do you see as the biggest challenges in um, sort of I don't want to say educating the public, that doesn't feel right, but translating these issues of digital privacy um, to a public that may not have that much experience. Um. Okay. Um, I don't know. Um, I, I feel that, I feel that um, there's so many things we have to, to deal with before we come to that point exactly. Because um, the most important thing from what, uh, what, what, what I perceive of the situation is that there's cultural barriers in the process. So cultural barriers means that what are people, I can't say it's a culture, but what are people sort of embedded in, in their daily lives to sort of a belief system? That is, the belief system is wrong, it's whatever it is. So for instance, I can give you a very good example. There's very strong tribal and ethnic, uh, and ethnic uh, boundaries in our country, in Kenya. And uh, that sort of overrides everything else, you see. It overrides the important issues. It, impo it overrides the fact that people aren't going to school. It overrides the fact that we're not having, we're not having proper ag agricultural systems. We're not having systems that are working for us. So to, to sort of, to sort of uh, we have to relate this to, because it's, it's it's at the moment also tough to sort of get people to work on issues themselves and issues are, people are hungry and all that, but still they don't make sense of it. So how to, how to look at the things that are barriers in society, how to sort of bring down those barriers then arrive to that point where we can now say, this is an issue we face, regardless of a barrier, we're all one, we're all together. And I'm, I'm really impressed when we look at, for instance, the major things that have happened in the country and people were together. We've had, for instance, during the Westgate, Kenyans came together regardless of who they were. And I mean, it's, it's, it's mind blowing what people can do and how much they can contribute financially and how much effort they can put in together. Now that needs to be something that needs to continue. What will make that continue is the question. You see, so the, the other thing that happened is there was the, the drought in Turkana, people were dying, but people contributed and millions of shillings and millions of dollars were raised to, to, to help these people. So let's look at what we can do to sort of bring down the cultural barriers, what those things that are standing in the way of people making sense of issues. Once we have that done, then I think we can sort of present this to people and they can act on it. I don't know, that's how I look at it. 
Um, it's actually quite similar in India in the sense that I think um, poverty is the main challenge when trying to translate these issues to the public. Um, poverty and everything that goes around, that goes along with it. But in the end of the day, I mean, even even to the people that, you know who are willing to listen to these issues, who are willing to be educated and everything, I think the main challenge in general is that people don't really acknowledge surveillance to be a threat to begin with, right? So they, they don't consider it to be a threat at all, or if they do, they think it's a threat that won't ever affect them personally because it's an indirect threat. It's not something they can see. It's like an, it's like an invisible threat. So in that sense, they always have, they always, you know, have the mainstream mantra, I have not, I'm not a terrorist, I have nothing to hide. Oh, I know they won't target me. Oh, oh okay, yes, sure, surveillance is a bad thing, but hey, it'll never happen to me, et cetera, et cetera which means that in the end of the day, they don't really take it seriously. They don't take surveillance seriously. And when they don't take, a, when they don't take it seriously, it's very hard to explain to them like, how to protect themselves, what, why it's so important, and everything else that comes along with that. So I think that is the biggest challenge. And then uh, the, the, along with that, um, the other biggest challenge, which I think is not an Indian challenge, I think that's a global challenge, is um, basically our own personal choice to disclose our data. Because in the end of the day, if we didn't choose to disclose so much data, that the NSA and all the NSAs of the world would have had a much harder time mining this data and matching patterns and making stories about us and targeting us based on these stories. So in the end of the day, I think that the biggest challenge to, to educate people about surveillance is our own personal choice to disclose our data. And that's because it's just convenient to do so. So basically in the, in the name of convenience, um, you know, we're being surveilled and we don't really care about um, do anything about it, at least not effectively, and I think that's the biggest challenge. Thank you. So I think we've got time to take a couple of questions. From, yeah, we do? Okay, great. So we've got time to take a couple of questions from the audience. Um, does anyone have any questions for my wonderful panelists? I see a hand. I see several hands. Okay. I'm curious um, when you, I mean, I guess I have two questions, but um, I'm curious about the anonymity thing just in general and I hope you'll expand on it because there are many different kinds of anonymity like you have traditionally had anonymity of where your eyes are on the page of a book for example and that's a very different kind of anonymity than whether or not you're required to carry ID or whether or not you're required to show it. Um, and I'm curious for example if you think in Bosnia in particular or if you think in the context of Africa or in the context of Jordan or in India that um, really things are essentially returning to a, a position of complete control and we just have this illusion of some liberty or if things are actually significantly worse in terms of the, the total liberty and that we're really on a, on a real decline and that we're losing even the kinds of anonymity that we wouldn't consider technical anonymity. Um, just like the real, like actual every little piece of privacy. And I wonder if you would consider that when we say privacy today we are using it in the way that people used to use the word liberty 50 years ago. And so when we say that privacy is sort of dead or that people don't care about privacy, if really what we're saying is that we are no longer at liberty, and maybe we never were anyway in some places in the world. Um, well, uh, at least in the case of Jordan, I can say that um, that last idea is true. Um, free expression, free speech, and uh, liberty in general um, wasn't there that much before. So privacy is not an issue by itself. Privacy is always connected to the issues of uh, f uh, free speech and expression in Jordan. And I think that um, that uh, being connected by the government itself with issues um, that um, concern military uh, courts for civilians and um, charges that are like completely against free speech, like insulting the king, undermining the regime, working to uh, change the constitution. All these things are uh, charges that people can uh, be charged with for shouting something out loud in the streets. So I think privacy is always in that area of free speech and um, I think that people can't really deal with it outside that square because uh, first of all, as I said, free speech wasn't really there for us to feel that we're losing it. Uh, and uh, the government, again, is uh, always connecting the two in the same cases. 
Okay. Uh, well, as, as I basically said at the beginning, you know, for, for, for I think that where, where I come from, it's really hard to grasp, you know, like the, the, the concept of privacy in a way that, that probably you do it here, you know, like, and, 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 you know, it's never, it has never been there, you know, for us to, 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 to really, at, or at least that's the perception of the people, you know, like you, you were always, you know, kind of like, uh, you were always public to the ones that wanted you, wanted to know everything about you, you know, like, so, so, you know, it was, it was never an issue whether, whether, whether you had the liberty to be, to be anonymous or not, you didn't, you know, like, and that's, that's basically, that what what people how people perceive it and I, and I think that you know like since it's kind of different now it's at least in the terms of 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 provisional freedom of expression it's out there much more than it used to be and then like the people actually you know kind of feel more satisfied than they than they were but you know I personally think that we are that 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 like you know we are in decline even if we had like a little a very short breadth of something that was that was that was considered to be like you know maybe I don't know some sort of some sort of different stage in, in in terms of like you know having more 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 liberties and 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 everything you know like but you know we are we are we are global in decline and that's that's the fact and you know like we are just picking up the pace with the rest of the world as as a country so and we are feeling it much less because we we don't we don't have have anything to match it with you know in 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 general so that's basically the Bosnian case and 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 I and I, you know like from my perspective. It looks different, but I'm trying to give you like a perspective of the population that's actually, you know, like that, that, that's the way they are feeling it. Um. So um, basically when you talk, we talk of anonymity, um, I think there's no better tool to use in terms of, or better media to use to, to, to sort of get that anonymity, except for instance, the best tool is the internet. I don't know. It's, it's just work wonders, the, the sorts of things you can do with it. So um, I know you know of various tools that people can use to sort of get that anonymity in, in the process of doing something about staying anonymous online. So breaking the news or stuff like that. So that's, that's sort of what anonymity is at the moment. So um, I, I really believe that um, privacy is on a decline and uh, it's, it's, it's getting worse, it's going to get worse, uh, unless something really happens and, I mean, un unless, uh, unless something is done about it or, but, but the way things look, it's, it's gonna get worse. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much for your insights and it's really great to hear different perspectives. I was wondering, for example, for the case of India, whether if it ever kind of came out that Supreme Court judges were spied on um, and they would kind of see what the files on them are and all that, or whatever, high class politicians from, from the BIP, BIP party or whatever, whether that would change the game a little bit or not, that be in, I, I'd be interested in that. And in the Bosnian case, I'd be interested especially to know, I mean, because previously, um, the surveillance was kind of relatively clear-cut, in a sense, and now it's kind of very messy, because, in a sense, you wouldn't necessarily know who is buying, and how do people deal with those things, whether that kind of, um, what kind of strategies do you have for that, whether that's an issue, because I'd be interested in that, yeah. Uh, thank you for your questions. Uh, with regards to your India question, uh, actually, that's a, that's a very interesting question. So uh, in 2011, for example, um, allegedly the National Technical Research Organization was uh, snooping on politicians and uh, basically was snooping on them through off-the-air deception um, solutions. So following that, uh, the Home Ministry issued um, a directive to ban off-the-air interception. However, even though they banned technically off-the-air interception, a lot of other types of surveillance are still being carried out, even off the air interception of GSM phones. So ev even though it's technically banned, it's still being carried out. And since 2011, surveillance has only increased in India. Um, like the central monitoring system, for example, which I mentioned before, um, it was like in a more initial phase at the time, but since then it's been fully carried out. Um, since then they've applied the UID biometric system and a whole bunch of other surveillance systems. So 
Yes, and so in India, for example, surveillance is not only applied in a top-down manner, but you also do see a lot of surveillance within the elites. You know, um, one agency snooping on politicians, for example. But even even though that's the case, there's still a lot of surveillance and they're still increasing it. it yeah, it, it doesn't make sense, in my opinion, but they're still carrying it out. Uh, probably they have their own agenda, I suppose. I'll just brief, briefly respond to, the, to that part. You know, like, it's, it's a little bit... Uh, I mean, I, it's true what you said, but you know, like, st you still know who's actually doing the surveillance. It's not that unclear, you know, like, it, it's maybe, it's maybe before it was a given, now it's like, you know, now it's hidden. That's, that's maybe the, the difference, you know, before, in, but you know, in, in either way, you pretty much are, are aware who, who is doing it. And you know, like, what are people doing? Basically, in general, nothing, you know, like, as, as and they're taking it for granted and they're actually, you know, like, you know, they they're, 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 they basically think that that you know it is the right somehow of the of the of the whoever is doing it to do it. You know, like that's that's basically the perception of the of the population because you know, like anyways, their lives in in general are are in the hands of other people, and then then they like you know don't care to be surveilled at the same time. That's at least my impression. You know, I, I might be wrong, and and that's that's I, I don't like to generalize it in a way. In, in such a way, because there are groups and, and people who are who are doing something about it, but that's very that, that's a minority, you know. Like, and and, and if you talk to about the, the population in general, they're not doing much about it at all. Thank you. Um, um, I would like to hear more. Actually, the question was asked by the moderator, and I would like to hear more arguments. Uh, you know, how do you guys try to convince the people you work with that privacy matters? I'm a little bit uncomfortable with the idea that, you know, people don't care about privacy because they don't understand, or maybe we understand more than they do. Uh, maybe it, there's a problem with the arguments we use. I mean, if you start by saying the Fourth Amendment says, it, it doesn't get, it's, it's not going to work, especially in countries where there is a stigma attached to the U.S., etc. And maybe there is a problem with the way we we we, we ask questions. Maybe it's a question of freedom. Uh, and, and if, if you can't speak your mind or if you are surveilled then there is a that's a that's a threat to your ability to 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 to, to speak about other rights i just want to hear more arguments from you guys anyone else want to add to their um good question so um in india i i, I wouldn't say that people um don't care about their privacy what i would say is that a large percentage of the population um don't know what privacy is or don't see it as a right per se. They're not, they're not aware that it's a right to begin with. Um, and then those who are aware of it see, uh, don't see privacy as secrecy per se, but they see privacy as control over their personal data, or at least this illusionary type of control over their personal data. Now, when trying to persuade them of why privacy matters, um, you're absolutely right. It's more effective to show them like the implications of what actually happens. Which is why um, I try, which is why we try, like in our various articles and our blo blogs and everything, to map things out like that. But now we're starting to turn towards uh, the use of infographics more, because what we're realizing is that like really long dry reports are completely ineffective. Nobody's not gonna, nobody's gonna read them. Um, I mean, hell, in the other day, not even we read them after we write them. So we're, tr we're turning towards infographs and we're trying to like visualize all our data in a way where people, like it, anyone, can understand what that actually means. They can see, for example, we've created like a, a privacy map, an India monitor privacy map, and this map essentially includes data on uh, the UID, on CCTNS, on drones, on CCTV cameras, uh, on the NPR, in every single state in India. So by clicking on a state in the map, you, you get access to the data. And that way, because it's interactive, it kind of makes more sense, it kind of explains things more visually to people. And, that way th they might get a better idea of what's going on and why it matters. Then further on, with regards to our research on surveillance technologies, um, so previously I uh, published uh, this massive database, but I don't think anyone read it because it was just so hard to go through. I mean, not even I would go through it once it was on the website. Um, so then we, we thought like maybe it'd be more effective to again visualize this data, and that's actually the process that we're doing. What we're doing right now, we're busy visualizing it, and it should be on our website in the next two weeks. And hopefully, once the once it's done, uh, people will be able to access it and see in a very graphic way, an entertaining way, if you will, uh, or and actually be terrified, hopefully, uh, with regards to what's going on. But 
that's that's sort of with regards to the public, and that's sort of with regards to people who actually have internet access and who will, you know, try to inform themselves about these topics to begin with. Then there's a whole other category, which is the industry. So um, when we try to explain to them why privacy matters, we try to bring them concrete arguments, like uh, especially when we're dealing with the industry, like, hey, this is bad business if you don't um, respect people's privacy. It's bad business. You will lose money. We have that kind of approach. Because that's, that's the only way they'll listen in the day, right? So for example, um, like uh, what I mentioned before, like when we have privacy roundtables and we have a lot of members from the industry, we try to explain to them that, hey, it's in your interest to um, support this privacy legislation because by doing so, you will get more customers. Because at the end of the day, customers will outsource their data to companies who handle it in a way that's respectful to their data. I think we have just one, you have one more? Okay, great, thanks. Hi, um, since we were talking about the cultural context, um, I, uh, for example, know about Hong Kong a little bit more, and it, I know it, in China it's different, but here usually it's, uh, we discuss as if, if everyone um, agrees that priv uh, privacy is really something important and it's naturally connected to liberty and we just have to make clear that this connection exists. Uh, but my experience is that uh, that privacy is something bad. This is not a concept, for, at least for the general Hong Kong. I mean, if you, if you if you know you grew up with six people in a, f a small four-room apartment, uh, people say, yeah, yeah. So everyone knows about everyone else's. So so what's the big deal? So this is even. I, I think the the dif difficulty there is even much more. And um, my experience is maybe for us the surveillance itself is is the biggest problem. But if you if you then point out, like, maybe, maybe the bus driver is the suspect, and maybe next time on the airport you will have a longer time waiting or even being interrogated or whatever because you took the wrong bus driver on the way somewhere. So it, sometimes the, the, the strategy is more on the effects, although the, this is not the basic problem, but I think it's a high-level discussion to, to talk about uh, the surveillance and the privacy, but for most people it's a concrete, it, it has to be made very concrete how, how this, it affects them. And um, maybe you can, you can say something to the, those differences because I was very surprised by, by this kind of cultural uh, difference of the value of privacy uh, and liberty itself. So um, a lot of the successful campaigns, I can say, and, and this is something that the corporate world has really done so well and they're really doing business out of it is understanding the underlying values and cultural pr principles. So anything cannot sell. We can look at, for instance, what HSBC does in various countries and they really market this so well on CNN and all that is they show that they understand the underlying culture, they work with it, they get the business. So in any exercise, it's very important to do design thinking to do the initial research before, to understand what the problem is, to understand what the underlying values are, to work with those. Then to, when you're doing design thinking, you sort of try to engage various types of people in, 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 a, in, a, in a discussion, in whatever it is, or just go out in the streets and talk, a, talk to people about it in random sample and see if it's going to work. It's the only approach that works. It is why Coca-Cola is in China. It is, why, it is why if you look at HSBC, it's all over the world because that's what they work with. What do, do we work with in the cultural system but disrupt that market, disrupt, bring that change? That is a very important component. Any final, you don't have to, just any final comments? Okay, great. Thank you guys very much. Um, thank you to my excellent panelists um, and, uh, yep. Oh, sorry, did I miss, I can't see, I'm sorry. Do you have a pen? <laughs> Please, I'm sorry. Uh, with regards to your question, you're absolutely right. Uh, privacy does change with, um, in different cultural contexts. In India, for example, uh, the example you mentioned in Hong Kong where you can have six people living in the same flat, you have the exact same, uh, you, actually in most cases that's the case in India. So definitely they don't see privacy the way we do. But um, one of the most uh, mainstream questions I hear with regards to this in India, like a lot of people in India ask me like, why should we have the right to give up our, ri our right to privacy? Like why should we have this right to begin with, you know? Because, you know, I mean, that doesn't make sense for us. And sure, uh, we do understand that, okay, it may not make sense for them because they've, 
they're raised in a different way and different culture and everything. At the same time, privacy is not really about how much privacy you have with a few people you, you choose to like share a flat with or whatever. Privacy is basically about protection, your, your individual protection from abuse from those in power. So in order to protect the individual from abuse from those in power, you need to have certain safeguards, whether they're legal or technical, to protect them from the authority. So that applies to everybody regardless of, the, of, of their culture. Everybody, regardless of, of their content, regardless of their culture, regardless of the political system, everybody should be protected from abuse of power from those in, from those in the authority. Can I add one more thing? Um, I would like to say that um, also in, in the Arab world, we've recently been seeing more and more cases of activists more, going more open and like just saying things out loud and uh, maybe that might seem like um, them caring less about their privacy but because the issues of privacy and free speech are so much connected in the Arab world because the only or at least the main reason governments um, preach uh, privacy in the Middle East is because they are using it as a way to control uh, free speech and limit it. So in a way people think that if they're open and out loud uh, that, that could be like um, a way for them to protect themselves because that's how you say that this is what, who I am, that's what uh, I do, that's what I believe in and if you get in trouble later on people can recognize that right away and uh, they would see that the only reason um, the government was using uh, this or that person's uh, personal information is to, to limit their free speech. Great. Thank you. Any, any final comments this time? Ooh, okay. Um, <laughs> awesome. Thank you guys so much. Um, thank you to my wonderful panel. Uh, and Geraldine, uh, back to you. Thank you so much, Gillian. Do a wonderful job moderating that. Let's have some applause.